We want to welcome everyone to our Tuesday evening Bible study here at Grace Church at 4052 Arno Road in Franklin, Tennessee. For those of you who are joining us by the internet, we welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we want you to know that you can view Sundays and Tuesday studies on YouTube, Ustream, and Sermon Audio Video. I'm going to ask everyone here to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5, and after our study this evening, I'll give you some information regarding our dear brother Ed Adamowicz, uh, and tell you kind of where he is. I was able to visit him this afternoon in Nashville. This is the third of five studies on the grace of God, and uh, I have chosen to use our English word grace, G-R-A-C-E, acoustically, and uh, to build a foundation for understanding the doctrine of grace. So as I have told you, the grace of God stands upon goodness, righteousness, atonement, covenant, and election. G for goodness, R for righteousness, A for atonement, C for covenant, and E for election. By having some understanding of these components of grace, we'll have a greater appreciation for our salvation, and we'll have a greater and more reverent, I think, and respect for the Almighty God of grace. Uh, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. When we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I should have read it like this. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. All right, let us pray. Father, we call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus, asking you to enlighten our minds and give us a good understanding of this great work of atonement as it fits into the great gospel and salvation of grace, which you have bestowed upon all who come to Christ in saving faith. We ask your blessings on our studies in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake, for his honor, for his glory. Amen. All right, now the grace of God is revealed to the sons and daughters of Adam, as I have told you in the first study, because of the goodness of God. But if it were not for the goodness of God, <clears throat> no human being would ever be saved. The Lord is good, therefore he has determined to save a number of Adam's race. Many people who espouse the sovereign grace of God have the attitude that very few people will be in heaven, but that is not what the Scripture says. Revelation chapter 7, John says this, beginning in verse 9, And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, 
And they all stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes, with palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts. And they all fell down before the throne on their faces, and they worshiped God, and they said, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So he said, I saw a great number which no man could number. And he said, it was from all nations, and kindreds, and peoples, and tongues. So it is because of the goodness of God that we have the grace of God. That's the G in grace. But the goodness of God could not be shown until and unless the righteousness of God released it. That is to say, the Lord's goodness can't be shown at the expense of His righteousness. And that's the R in our English word Grace, righteousness. So although the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, our sins disqualified us from receiving his goodness. Now I want you to hear this statement and I'm going to try to clarify it for you. The Lord will not save an unrighteous sinner. Now that may seem confusing, but this is something of what the blind man in John chapter 9 said when he said, we know that God does not hear sinners. John 9, verse 31. Yes, the Lord saves sinners, but not in their own righteousness. The righteous Lord loves righteousness. And as the righteous Lord, he is too holy to look upon sin. He will have nothing to do with sin, and yet he desires to show his goodness. Well, how can this be done? Well, the goodness of God is released by the righteousness of God, which stands upon the atonement of God. I hope you still have your Bibles open to this Romans 5, verses 6 to 11 passage. So the G in grace is goodness, the R in grace is righteousness, and the A in grace is is atonement. So let me say this again. The goodness of God is released by the righteousness of God, which stands upon the atonement of God. Now, according to these verses in Romans 5, verses 6 through 11, number one, it is through the atonement that we're given strength with God. It says, when we were without strength, in due time Christ died. Secondly, through the atonement we're counted godly because he died for the ungodly. Thirdly, through the atonement, we are made good in the sight of God. He said, scarcely for a righteous man would one die, peradventure, perhaps for a good man some would die. Number four, through the atonement, we are taught of the love of God. Number five, through the atonement, we are justified. This is all in these verses. Number six, through the atonement, we are saved from the wrath of God. And number seven, through the atonement, we are reconciled. Now, it is through the atonement that we are made clean in the sight of God. Now, to be clean in the sight of God is to be right with God. To be right with God is to be righteous in the sight of God. It is through the atonement that we're made clean that is righteous with God. And so that's why the last phrase, verse 11, is it any wonder that all who are made righteous in the sight of God, joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have received the atonement. Now the first important lesson that I want to bring to you tonight is this. This word that is most of your versions translated atonement. Some of you may have this word and this would be the correct translation. You might have the word reconciliation. This word should have been translated in Romans 5.11 where he says 
by whom we have now received the atonement, it should have been translated by whom we have now received reconciliation. We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received reconciliation or the reconciliation. Now the word translated atonement in Romans 5.11 is the Greek word katalage and it means to reconcile. And it is a word that is taken from the world of money changes when people exchange money and the uh, money changes have to do with the exchange of equivalent values. If you say, did you have change for a quarter, and you give me a coin, we call a quarter, and I give you two dimes and a nickel, we're reconciled. Okay? If you say, did you have uh, a couple of quarters for 50 cents, and I give you two quarters, and you give me 50 cents, we're reconciled. Now, this word katalage, which is translated atonement, is from the world of the money changes. It has to do with reconciliation. The term atonement is taken from the atonement work of the high priest of Israel, especially the day we call Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. Now, if you would like to, in your Bibles, you can turn to the Old Testament book of Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, and uh, Leviticus, the third book of Moses in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. G for goodness, R for righteousness, and A for atonement. Again, the term atonement, the English word atonement, taken from the atonement work of the high priest of Israel, the day we call Yom Kippur, Y-O-M-K-I-P-P-U-R. Two different words, Yom, Y-O-M, and Kippur, K-I-P-P-U-R, that's to anglicize it from the Hebrew. Yom Kippur is the most solemn day on the Jewish calendar, even today. It is the holiest day of the year for Jews. It is a day of affliction. It is observed on the 10th day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, the month in Hebrew that's called Tishrei, Tishrei, it was just observed in the United States and around the world by Jews, September 24th and 25th. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, just observed on our September 24th, 25th. Usually it's observed in September or October. You know how the calendar shifts. Uh, this is the what? The third and, th and this is uh, Tuesday, and next week, uh, next year, this won't be the third. It'll be the fourth. It'll be a, a different day. Or uh, the fourth or the third will be on a different day. So Tishrei, spelled T-I-S-H-R-I, Tishrei is the month, which is the seventh month, and on the tenth day of Tishrei, Yom Kippur has always, since God initiated it, since he gave it to Moses, uh, on the 10th day of the seventh month, and its central themes, uh, as observed by the Jews, are atonement and repentance. Now, modern-day Jews observe this holy day with a 25-hour period of fasting and prayer. And here, get this now the purpose of which, the 25 hours of fasting and prayer, the purpose of which is to seek to expiate their sins and achieve reconciliation with God. So they're trying to get reconciliation with God through prayer and repentance. And they've been doing that for thousands of years, and they're still doing that uh, today. Now, our English word... Atonement. I'm going to come back to the Jewish observance of Yom Kippur in just a minute. 
But our English word, atonement, as, as I have explained to you before, is made up of a prefix and a suffix, uh, and, uh, two words and, and, a, and, a, and a suffix. You've got A-T, at, you've got O-N-E, one, and you've got the, the suffix ment, M-E-N-T. So when the 1611 translation of Scripture was done, probably that term atonement meant more like it was more aligned with what we think of in, as reconciliation in those days than it is today. But at one moment, if two parties are separated, they have to have somebody that can bring those two parties together, just like we need in Washington, D.C. tonight. <laughs> we need somebody that can bring these Democrats and these Republicans together. I understand that today they just got rid of the leader of the Republican Party. They can't even get along among their own party much less with each other. So you have to have somebody to bring God, the holy God, and man, the unholy sinner, together. This is one reason why the Lord Jesus Christ must be both God and man. He must be man so he can die. He must be God so his death has value. Otherwise, he's just a another death, another sinner dying like you and like me. So all of this comes into play with the idea of atonement. Well, back to Yom Kippur. Most of the modern Jews spend those 25 hours celebrating the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Most of those, that time is spent in a synagogue service. Uh, much of it might involve fasting as, along with the prayer and repentance. They go to other people that they think they've wronged and they try to make things right with them. All of that is involved in the Yom Kippur celebration. That day, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, completes the annual period known in Jerusalem as the High holy days. So here in the 16th chapter of Leviticus, we're going to look at this, this evening. The book of Genesis reveals the creation of the human race. The book of Exodus reveals the redemption of the people of God. And the book of Levit Leviticus reveals how God's Old Testament people under the law were to worship him acceptably uh, and with acceptance, or acceptably and with reverence, I should say. So according to the teaching of the book of Leviticus, and especially here we're uh, going to look at chapter 16 in just a minute, but let me bring you up to this, this chapter. According to the teaching of the book of Leviticus, the Lord has determined to have a clean people. Now, I want you to listen to this. In chapter 11 of Leviticus, he deals with clean foods. In chapter 12, verses 13 through 46, he deals with clean bodies. In chapter 13, verses 47 through 59, he deals with clean clothes. In chapter 14, verses 33 through 57, he deals with clean houses. In chapter 15, he deals with clean contacts. And in chapter 16, he deals with having a clean nation. Now, when I say clean, you understand by what I've already said that that means righteous. If you're clean with God, you're righteous with God. Okay? Now, many of you, how many of you have the book, Explore the Book? David, you happen to have that? It's a great book. It's by J. Sidlow Baxter. Wonderful book. I looked up to see what Mr. Baxter might say about some of these things, and I, and I put this in my notes. This is what he said in his book called Explore the Book. He said, if any scripture confirmation were required for the old proverb, 
cleanliness is next to godliness. You ever heard that saying? Most people think that's in the Bible, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> That's why a lot of people feel like they're close to God because they take a bath every day. Some of us will have other problems, take two or three baths a day. <laughs> but he says if any scripture confirmation were required, that is a scripture to confirm the old proverb, cleanliness is next to godliness, Leviticus 11 through 16 would be quite enough. These chapters tell us that God's people must be a clean people. They must be clean both inwardly and outwardly. They must be, uh, there must be physical cleanliness. There must also be ceremonial cleansing from that which defiles them morally and spiritually in the eyes of God. They are to be both sanitarily clean and sacrificially cleansed. That's a good statement by J. Sidlow Baxter. Now, of course, this entire section of Scripture, which was addressed to Israel as a nation, but I believe spiritually to the people of God in every generation, in a spiritual sense, we can learn some lessons about Christ and the gospel from them. The, the, the big emphasis is to make a difference between, you've read this in the Bible, between the clean and the unclean. In other words, to mark or separate those who are God's children from the children of the world. And the scripture does that, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's why God says you're to be a separate people. And you know, I've told you before that the word hagiazo, used in the New Testament, translated holy and translated sanctification, it means to be separated unto God for his exclusive use, for his glory. That's what the word means in the New Testament. When you're sanctified, you are set apart in Christ under God to serve him for his glory and for his honor. Now, there has to be then some type of cleansing for sinners to be accepted in the sight of God, and this comes through the atonement. Now, according to Leviticus 16 and verse 30, you want to look at that? Verse 16 and verse 30. The priest shall make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. You see that? The priest will make an atonement to you. I told you Sunday that the main job of the priest is to the prophet, let me back up, the prophet tells the people the will of God. The prophet says, thus saith the Lord. Okay? The priest goes to God on behalf of the people. The prophet says, thus saith the Lord. He reveals the will of God to the people. The priest represents the people to God. So he says, the priest shall make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now the day of atonement as practiced by the priest of Israel is set forth for us here in Luke chap uh, Leviticus chapter 16. Now on this day, the priest woke up very early. What day is that? It's the seventh month of Tishrei and the tenth day. The priest, the high priest, woke up very early and he put on his priestly garments because on this most holy day, the priest would offer incense and uh, sprinkle blood on the Ark of the Covenant. How many of you know what the Ark of the Covenant is? Anybody does not know what the Ark of the Covenant is? Anybody does not know? It's just a little square box and uh, it has two angelic creatures. And uh, the, the tips of their wings is just a little small space between, and, and it's in that little space that God said, I'll meet you right there. The great God of the universe said, I'll meet you right in that little small space, just above the lid on the square box. The lid is called the what? What's it called? It's called the mercy seat. The mercy seat is that lid on top of that box. That's called the mercy seat. 
the propitiation, the mercy seat. Inside the box, there were, at one time, there was manna that fell from heaven. There was Aaron's rod that budded. and There was a dry stick that became alive. That's a picture of what? Of the virgin birth of Christ, because he came out of a womb of a woman whose womb had not been fertilized by the sperm of a man. And then there was a copy of the law in, in this uh, little square box, just a little small square box. And on that day, the priest woke up early. He put on his priestly garments because on that day, he's going to make atonement for Israel. Now, look at verses 1 and 2 in Leviticus 16. Only on this day, only on this day could the priest enter the Holy of Holies. Only on this day. The Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Do you know what that is? I wish we had more time. But God killed Aaron's two sons because they offered strange fire to the Lord, and he killed them. And uh, it upset Aaron, but it says he held his peace. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what I told you when I mentioned to you that God is holy and he cannot be approached except in the way that he prescribes by the person he prescribes. And you can't approach him without blood. Verse 1. The Lord spake to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, so I won't have to kill him. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. He said, you tell Aaron, he makes sure that he cannot come into the Holy of Holies except on this one particular day. Okay? Now listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 9. Listen to this. Into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. So he says in Hebrews 9 verse 7 that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once, that's on this day of Yom Kippur, once, the tenth day of the seventh month, once a year, and he couldn't go in without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors or the sins of the people. And he says the Holy Spirit is signifying by that, that the way to God was not yet made known, the full way to God which we have in Christ. Okay, now look at verse 3, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 3. The high priest must come with a burnt offering and a sin offering for himself. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Now, number 3, he must come with a burnt offering and a sin offering for himself. And he must be dressed, according to verse 4, in the full dress of the high priest. Verse 4, he shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with the linen girdle, and with the linen mitre, that's that gold up here above his head, that had holiness unto the Lord written on it. So everywhere he turned, it said holiness unto the Lord. And this square piece of gold up here, holiness unto the Lord, the mitre. Okay, it says, shall be attired with these, these are the holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and then put them on. It is said in centuries ago that the men that would translate the scripture, when they came to the name of God, would put their pen down and go take a bath and put on fresh clothes and get a fresh pen before they wrote the name of God. Today, all of that reverence and respect is gone. 
Today we have the attitude of the Old Testament people, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. In other words, he doesn't care, he's not going to do anything. He's just, 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 just these Christians are just blowing hot air. God's not going to do anything, good or evil. So he, he has to, he wakes up early, he puts on the priestly garment, he comes with a burnt offering and a sin offering for himself and his family. He comes dressed in this full dress of the high priest. And in verse 5, he must have two kids of the goats and one ram. He shall take of the con congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Verse 6, he would first offer a bull for himself and his family. Verse 6, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Okay? Then what would he do? Then he would cast two lots on those two kids, those two kids of the goats. They had two of them. And he would cast lots, just like, like casting dice. And look at verse 7 and 8. The two, the two kids of the goats were called the Lord's goat and the scapegoat. Okay? He'll take the two goats, verse 7, and he will present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the, the scapegoat. Okay? Then, whichever lot fell upon the Lord's goat, whichever one of those goats was called the Lord's goat, that goat would be slain, would be killed. Verse 9, Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Okay? The blood from that slain goat, which is called the Lord's goat, would be put upon the scapegoat. The blood from the slain goat would be put on the, on the scapegoat. And then what would happen to the scapegoat? The scapegoat would be led out of the camp, out into the wilderness, and released. Look at verse 10. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Now don't you see a beautiful picture of how Christ is slain and we get to go free. But the blood of the slain goat is put on the scapegoat. <laughs> and then the scapegoat is led through the people, through all the crowds, and they watch him as he goes out over the wilderness way out there and lets him go free. Because the other goat died in his place. So here's a conclusion to tonight's study. The goodness of God could not be shown without the righteousness of God being satisfied. In other words, unless we are clean with the Lord, the goodness of God cannot be ours. And so the goodness of God, depending on the righteousness of God, stood upon the atonement. And it's through the atonement that we are made righteous, that we are made clean, so that the goodness of God and the mercy of God can be shown to us. So here's what it says in Matthew 27, 51. It tells us that the God of heaven is no longer approached through the temple, through the priest, and through animal sacrifices, but through the high priest of heaven, Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, 51. Then Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary was torn in two from the top to the bottom and the earth shook and the rocks were split open. Now that curtain, once I brought a message to you about that curtain, that curtain is so thick it takes a team of horses to separate it. 
It's not something a group of men could get and tear it. Number two, it tore from the top. That thing was big. I used to remember exactly how many feet up it went. It tore from the top to the bottom. In other words, God reached down and tore it from the top to the bottom, signifying to us that we no longer approach him through that veil. On the other side of that veil was the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant where the priest went in once a year to make an atonement. So God signified by that that this is not any longer the way you will approach me. Now, Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, tells us that our being made clean, our being made righteous with God, came about through one sacrifice for sins forever on earth. Let's read it first. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, a tabernacle not made with hands, the temple was made with the hands of men. It was made by the instructions of God, but it was made with the hands of men. But the, the temple down here, Moses continually told them, uh, God continually told Moses, be sure that you make this exactly after the pattern that I showed you is in heaven. He gave him a blueprint of what's in heaven. There's a temple, there's a tabernacle in heaven. And that's what this verse is telling us about. He says, Christ became a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now here's what this verse says. This verse says that just like the high priest of Israel would go in with the blood of these bulls and bullocks and goats, Jesus Christ went into heaven with his own blood. He went into heaven with his own blood, which was shed as a man, as our substitute, as the one who stood in our room and in our stead. He went into heaven with his own blood, not with the blood of bulls and goats, with his own blood. He entered into the, the real holy of holies, the very presence of God in, the hev in heaven, having obtained. In other words, it's a finished work. It's done. Redemption for us. So when we go back to that Romans 5 passage, when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, that's you and me. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. You can't hardly get anybody to die for anybody else today. They don't want to die for themselves, much less somebody else. For adventure for a good man some would die, but God commended his love toward us in Christ, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Then he goes on to say, We'll justify his blood, by his blood. We'll be saved from wrath when the wrath of God falls on this world. We'll be saved from that. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now being reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. That is, he is alive. He is at the right hand of God making intercession for all who come unto God by him. So he's alive. We have a live Christ. Not only this, he says, but we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the reconciliation, the atonement, the offering that takes the two parties that are separated and brings them to one, the at one -ment. So by his atoning sacrifice, our Savior satisfied all of the demands of God's holy law on our behalf thus making us clean or making us righteous in the sight of God and allowing the goodness of God to have mercy upon us for the sake of Christ. Our Father, we call upon you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this wonderful news that our salvation stands upon a satisfied, a just foundation. And that's why we, we, when we read in your word that you are faithful and just 
to forgive us and to keep on cleansing us from our sin 